Hello, it's uh, Writing Wednesday on a beautiful uh, October day. Uh, blue skies, the persimmons are ripening. Um, that green leading into orange, and soon they'll be um, huge and gorgeous. Um, and I've just been um, uh, lecturing, leading, uh, thinking uh, up at uh, the Wrightwood Literary Festival, uh, which was extremely fun. And I've just found um, Rattle uh, Poetry Magazine has uh, on their Facebook author page, on their Facebook page, they have a, once a week they do a live critique of poetry. Uh, so you can see like what poets are struggling with and what they cut out and how they think about a poem is super interesting. Uh, I can see that I'm going to become addicted to that. Um, and, uh, you know, life goes on. Uh, still more uh, um, Chimes of Lost Cathedral things. I'm going to be uh, uh, in conversation with Renee Denfield, who wrote uh, The Child Finder. She has a new book called The Butterfly Girl. And we are going to be talking about our books because Chime certainly has a lot of a lot of orphans in that book. And my character works with them. And I have a lot of thoughts about children uh, with nobody to take care of them. So that's going to be fun. And then there's going to be on uh, October 12th, uh, on Saturday, uh, there's going to be a moonrise reading at the Bowtie Project uh, on the L.A. River, and I'll be reading with um, uh, a wonderful poet um, I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, Zoshi, who I knew from Squaw Valley. Um, so that's going to be really fun. And uh, so today is Writing Wednesday, and I'm answering a bunch of questions um, that people have sent, sent on the internet, uh, which is always fun to do. And uh, a lot of them have to do with tone. So I think uh, uh, that'll be kind of the, the general topic. But uh, they're just really interesting problems that people run into. Uh, and uh, it's just fun to collect them and just do them one after another. So, um, the first question is, I'm writing from the perspective of a character who is reserved. She doesn't show a lot of emotion. My last round of feedback called overwhelmingly for more development of character. How do I do this and at the same time stay true to her character? So this is, um not quite a tone question. This is more a point of view question. But, you know, everything has a way of communicating in fiction. So an, a reserved character, well, it's the point of view. This is your point of view character. And she can be reserved in her speech and still be very accurate in her judgments, in her thoughts. She can remember things, she can think things, things recall other things. Just because she is reserved in her nature doesn't mean she doesn't have thoughts about things. And that's the wonderful thing about fiction is that you can do people's thoughts as well as what they say. So they may appear very reserved, um, you know, uh, that she would enter a party and, um, you know, move to the kitchen to help with the refreshments. Um, her actions uh, are part of it. And then her inner thoughts. People who are reserved are often reserved because they, are, they can be quite judgmental, uh, that little shy person. Uh, in their head could really be, um, you know, kind of tart. And that's one of the reasons they're reserved is that they've learned not to share uh, what they really think. You don't want to be too reserved with the reader because that leaves them outside 
and they're just looking at somebody behaving and they don't after a while it's like well what's going on with this person uh, if you're making them the point of view character the um, uh, your if it's being told from their perspective they have to be mentally alert and have thoughts about things um, there are many writers who have reserved or seemingly reserved characters but that internal life is pretty interesting so when they overwhelmingly ask for more development of character I think you have to develop the inner world of the character um, so that we're, it's not just a cipher walking around there's a lot of internals um, I was asked that about um, Astrid in White Oleander you know we don't see, we don't understand her. We see things from her point of view, but we don't ever turn the camera around. It's hard to understand who that character is. So if you really don't know enough, of, if you find the character too reserved, if you can't penetrate them, if you don't know where they're coming from, then that's a problem as a writer. And you have to go in and... Um, ask all the characterological questions that we've dealt with in previous Writing Wednesdays. Uh, find out about them. You know, were they ever not particularly reserved? Did something happen to them that keeps them from communicating? Do they, what is their worldview? What do they read? What are their, you know, kind of, you know, just trying to find out who they are. Uh, very important. What were their parents like? What was their position in the family? How did this happen? Um, and so a reserved character, a character who's reserved doesn't liberate the writer from the duty of understanding who they are. And the more you understand who they are, then no matter how reserved they are, you will bring a full character. There's no excuse for lack of characterization just because the character is reserved. Um, you have to develop the inner life and show that they're reserved in their outer life. Um, but if they're also self-censoring, that's not going to be a really easy protagonist to use. So you either have to develop the inner life or... Um, you know, find somebody who's going to allow the reader in. Um, not necessarily other people, but the reader. Um, here's another uh, question. I'm meticulous about grammar in my manuscripts, but I'm casual in emails. I don't always capitalize or pe use periods. I use typical abbreviations. I think that comes across as friendly, but as a writer, I recently emailed, blasted me for it. Doesn't everyone go easy on rules on email? I certainly don't. I write emails as if I'm writing a letter to someone. I never use, you know, you and stuff. People do it in texts because uh, of the, the small uh, little buttons on your phone. Uh, if they write a lot, they, you know, they do get very breezy and easy with their, um, with their, um, writing. I, I don't, I write a complete sentence, even uh, pretty much, uh, even in a text. Uh, <laughs> so I just don't like it. And boy, if you're ever going to write to a writer, um, and you start seeing these things and I see them in in letters and emails um you know can you help me you know it's like probably not <laughs> um try to avoid uh text ease when you're emailing people who you want to have a good opinion of you um anyway i i but that is really useful if you are uh, writing fiction and you want to write the text of your character and your character is a, um, you know, kind of a pop, pop culture person who is just 
not thinking twice about hate, H, A, and then the character eight. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't do it personally, but I would definitely use it for a character that you want to establish that tone. Why not? Um, no, in email, definitely not. Uh, and not if you consider yourself a writer. Can I use several question marks when a character is confused? No. <laughs> I mean, unless it's just like the email thing, you know, the text thing. If they are writing a text to someone and they are 14 or 18 or whatever, and they are the type of person to put a lot of exclamation points and question marks and stuff, that's perfectly in character for them. But should a writer do it? Um, a little mark with question mark and exclamation mark when a character shouts a question. Yeah, you know, if it makes sense, if that's the way you want. But the question mark is a very, you know, it's a very strong thing in itself. I don't know that two of them, maybe once or twice in a novel, you know, that won't kill you. Um, but I wouldn't, unless you have a really gushy protagonist, you know, who is just like, everything is a panic and they're drama queen. And there's, yeah, then there's going to be a lot of question, you know, a lot of punctuation, a lot more than is necessary. But if you are writing exposition rather than the direct, direct you know, oh my God, you know, blah, blah. but if you're actually, you know, it depends on, you know, the level of diction. If you are writing as in third person um, and you're writing about a character who's confused, you don't want a lot of that, you know, what should I do? What should I do? It's not very interesting. Um, so I'd say, you know, always uh, less is more as far as the punctuation marks, the, the ex you know, the... The question marks, especially the exclamation. If your writing is forceful enough, you won't need that exclamation point. Um, like maybe three times in a novel, you know. I mean, I'm talking about really being spare on that. Uh, it, it, what it means is the writer doesn't have confidence in the strength of their own writing. So they're putting a lot of exclamation part. You know, it's like putting big arrows and stuff. If the writing is strong... You don't need it. Um, I've been having debates with fellow writers on the merits of using dashes over commas, specifically to separate parenthetical clauses and vice versa. How interchangeable are these points of punctuation? Good question. I like dashes, M dashes. There's a speed to them that you, the comma is more considered and the dash is more, um, there's just more urgency to it. It's a bigger gesture to make a dash. My, You should see my journals. Oh, my God, they're just full of them. Um, I use both. I use commas and dashes. But sometimes a point can, if you have a long sentence with a lot of clauses, sometimes the another comma will be confusing and the dash really sets something off. Um, I find it a strong, uh, a strong means of punctuation. Um, it often can be seen as a, an aside, even. Um, I like it better than parentheses, generally. Um, and this is super personal, but these are the kind of questions writers have. I like dashes. Um, I tend not to put commas and then people have to put them in. Uh, you know, I have to put them in later um, or vice versa. You know, these are last minute kind of things, but I, I anyway, I love the speed and the strength of a dash. Um, I think they're pretty interchangeable. I'm tired of one or two word titles. They don't seem to give the kind of insight into the story I'm hoping my titles will give. 
but I run into the problem of making titles too convoluted. What can I do about this? Titles are hard. Titles are hard. I always try for the short. I always try for shorter is better. But if I'm not getting anything vivid that's going to be memorable, uh, the, you know, the clock. Eh, am I going to remember that? No. You know, you know, Tales of the Haunted Clock. Yeah, it's more of a vivid image. You know, it's not great either because it's not, um, it's not as clear and unique an image um, as you might want. It's not as suggestive. It's kind of more hitting the nail on the head. But um, titles are really hard and anybody can be forgiven uh, a lot because there's some terrible titles out there that the writer obviously rejected a lot of other titles to get to that. And friends don't let friends go out with terrible titles. This is the, t this is the time that you talk, you, you pull your friends, you know, you readers, non-readers, you know, you pull them, you, you say, you know, here's 20, what do you think? I found titles either come right away, it's the first thing you have, second thing you have when you just begin, or they come at the end and are, you know, they're murder, it's murder. And using other people to say which of these 10 titles do you like the best is, is a brilliant way to go. I have someone dear, near and dear to me who has published a novel with a wretched title and I just thought my god if they had just taken a poll uh, this might not have happened <laughs> um, I hate titles with ing ing in them you know the gerund title you know boxing Helena or chewing up the carpet or whatever I don't like them uh, I, I've read a lot of books like with with those titles. There are sure a lot of them, but they, for some reason, that's one that always irks me. Um, it it's I like titles made out of you know I think poetry is a great place for titles, not necessarily the title of a poem or the title of a song, but even just a line, and that's fair use even if you use you know, somebody else's work, uh, it's fair use to use, like, Paint It Black. You know, I can't afford to use a stone song. I couldn't use the preface, you know, I couldn't use, a, you know, a stanza of Paint It Black because uh, the stones stuff, you really have to pay for, for permissions. But titles are fair game, a line, you know, fair game beautiful. The Bible, people have used the Bible for a long time for great, great titles. Um, and sometimes you'll, you know, want to use it, but it's has too much meaning for too many people. And uh, you have to just not use it. Uh, there's a wonderful title that I really, really wanted to uh, use for something, uh, an Ahmad of a title, um, um, Guest from the Future. Isn't that beautiful? But would I use an Ahmad of a title that everybody would recognize? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe. Or science fiction, Guest from the Future, pretty nice. But think about it. Think about it. Are people going to be furious at you for using it? Or will it give an overtone uh, that is descriptive? Uh, here's one. Um, I use words like moreover and ergo in my fiction. Others tell me this is too stodgy. This is the voice I find most comfortable. Must I change it? Well... <laughs> well, <laughs> it certainly gives a tone, if we're talking about tone. A character who says ergo and moreover is generally 
is pretty professorial. It's somebody who does a lot of academic writing. Um, it's uh, sometimes it's kind of legalese. Then that comes across as comic on the page. So if you want to have a character who is somewhat comic and tied up in this elevated academic diction, you're creating a character. And if that character says, moreover, and ergo, um, you want to use it and know that that's a comic thing to do uh, on some level. Um, or, you know, your lawyer, your elderly lawyer might say stuff like that, and it's slightly comic. Um, so what do I, you know, what is somebody who writes in an elevated tone for usually, you know, lawyers and academics who writes in that abstract, often passive voice tone and says things like moreover and heretofore and, you know, so forth. Um, it always is about character. If your character would say that, then have them say that. If your character is more, you know, if your character is a grosser, you might not want ergo and moreover. Um, if, you know, so it's always character. A tone comes from point of view, from character. But remember that that will be somewhat of a comic element to say ergo. Um, what are epigraphs? Well, epigraphs um, are, um, they're the little sayings or little bits of poems that happen at the beginning of the book. And a, a, a good epigraph, sometimes there are two of them, but a good epigraph is going to have a, um, it's going to set a, it often sets a tone. You know, if it's a wistful, a bit of a wistful poem, it's going to set up a wistful feeling for your book. If it is, um, it might have something to do with the setting, Ex you know, like a quote about if I'm writing a book about Los Angeles, I might have an epigraph of some other famous writer, uh, a, a little line or two from John Fonte about Los Angeles to set the tone and the reader can see what it's about. The epigraph in... Chimes of Lost Cathedral is part of a Mandelstam poem about um, uh, Petersburg, which is the scene of this book. So it's, we'll meet again in Petersburg. Um, We'll meet again in Petersburg as if we had buried the sun there. That's a very famous poem about the period that I'm writing about. Uh, and Mandelstam is, is a character in the novel. So we'll meet again in Petersburg as if we had buried the sun there, and for the first time we will utter the blessed senseless word. And that leaves you to wonder about the blessed senseless word. In the first volume of the Russia book, um, Marina, uh, Revolution of Marina M. I had a very famous, uh, a bit of a very famous Akhmatova poem, I Like a River. Um, have chain, have, let's see if I can, let's see if I can find a, here's I Like a, here's Marina M. So in this book, Revolution of Marina M, the epigraph is from Akhmatova, and it is, I almost name, name my book after it. Often the title is in the, the title of the book is in the quotation. And this is, I like a river have been diverted by the ruthless era. My life has switched. It flows into another channel past strange lands, and I no longer recognize my shores. Now that's, that's a perfect description of this novel. Um, so you're, it sets a tone, 
it might be where you got the title from. Um, it sets up the theme of the book, uh, the mood of the book. A lot of people use quotes from the famous classic classical authors, uh, Greeks, Latins, people who've had a lot of of a real classical education will use Greek and Latin, sometimes untranslated like T.S. Eliot uh, in The Wasteland or Proofrock. He's got his in Greece, in Greek. <laughs> what else? So those are epigraphs and they kind of set things off and you don't always need an epigraph, but they're really it's a very nice way to start uh, for a reader. Here's another tone question. I'm told my stories sound too formal, but I'm following rules and advice I've learned over the years in literature classes. What am I doing wrong? Well, again, it is the correlation of your point of view character and the diction of the work. So if you have a character going ergo and moreover driving a cart somewhere in, you know, Kansas in 1880, your diction is off. Um, so the f level of formality has to do with the level of formality in their daily, in that person's daily life. Um, you can do... Um, a less, a more formal version of that person on the cart um, by doing it in third person and having authorial, usually authorial omniscient uh, point of view. So the author is pretty far back from the character. Uh, and then you can use your formal language. But if people are saying it's too formal, it means there's a there's a disconnect between the diction, the level of diction, and the um, point of view character and what story is being told. There needs to be a you know, really good, tight correlation um, between the two. I have often find the opposite to be a problem, too, not just too formal for the material, but not formal enough for the material, especially people who are writing historical. I just started and just could not read, I read like 80 pages of it, of a book set in the Victorian age. And they like to use all the, you know, the atmospherics of the Victorian age, you know, kind of sort of a little gothic, kind of like going to Hogwarts or something. But um, the diction is, it's told in present tense, which is incredibly modern way to tell a story. And I just could not get over the fact that the language was not Victorian, even though the book was set in Victorian times. Um, it just makes it look really fake. It sounded really fake. I just couldn't read it. It was terrible. If you look at A.S. Byatt's um, book, Possession, there's two different timelines. There's a contemporary and a Victorian timeline. And let me tell you that Victorian timeline has Victorian language. It's beautiful and it's really well done. And they don't try to modernize it. They don't write in present tense. They don't write in first person. You know, it is, they've read a lot of Victorian literature and they have managed to recreate that voice. Very, very important to do. Um, that's the most important thing to do with language is to make sure that it, it's the correct language, the correct level of diction for your characters and when they are, and where they are, and what their class is, and how educated they are, and everything. You know, that's super important. That's, that's writing. So here's a few more questions while we're answering. So we're answering questions from, uh, from readers today. Um, random people. So, must my story have an antagonist, or can the protagonist be his own antagonist? There, 
doesn't always have to be an antagonist when we think of, you know, the villain, you know, the good guy and the bad guy, the villain. There isn't always a villain per se, but there are always people who are frustrating the protagonist's progress to whatever it is that they're looking to do. Uh, so, you know, if your mom is always in your way, doesn't, you know, are they an antagonist? Or are they just a, a frustrating force? Um, I think that having, I have a lot of antagonists in my work, a lot of characters who are frustrating my main character. Uh, and some of them are genuine antagonists, and some of them are real villains, so to speak. But I'm always careful to make sure that that person gets their due, because as we know, not nobody sees themselves as an antagonist, a bad guy, a villain. Nobody's a villain to themselves. You know, they always have reasons for doing what they do, and that's very interesting. I, I find that much more interesting than the thoroughgoing villain. Um, can a protagonist be his own antagonist? I think most of them are, because you have your there's always a um, contradiction. People have contradic inner contradictions, and that makes them struggle against themselves, the struggle with themselves. So you might want to see that as an in interior struggle. Can my antagonist be non-human? Sure. You know, antagonist could be the weather. You know, an antagonist could be you know, um, the river. There's all kinds of antagonists uh, or antagonistic elements. What's, is there such a thing as too much backstory? Absolutely. You know, you only need as much backstory as you need to understand the scene that you're reading. You know, too much backstory and your reader feels like this isn't going nowhere. So you have that fishing line. You got your reader on the line, you know, and it's a play. How much can you play him out before he just leaves? He or she just escapes. Um, so generally backstory is what people don't necessarily need to the extent that writers want to tell them. So just think, what do I need to that readers will understand their reaction to that moment? Maybe a, maybe a paragraph, maybe, you know, less. Uh, so try as hard as you can to just limit the backstory to what you need to fully understand what's going on in the front story at that time, in that scene. Um, what's the difference between scenes and chapters? A scene is one place, one time, and something happens. A chapter could be one scene, depending on how big it is, uh, or it could be several scenes. The needs of a chapter are to keep, to make, sometimes making time pass, sometimes the handoff to another character. Um, sometimes it breaks in the middle of a scene. Uh, Dickens did that, that's called a cliffhanger. So whatever it is, you can use a chapter break for any number of reasons, but a scene is a unit of action and generally, um, uh, it is not necessarily a full chapter. Uh, you can have several scenes in a chapter. Um, here's, an, uh, here's an interesting one. It's something I haven't thought very much about. How can I successfully incorporate themes of faith into my fiction? You know, this could be a description of anything from, you know, Christian literature that we see at the drugstore to 
you know, the, the highest production of literary craft. Um, themes of faith. You know, it's asking the big questions. Uh, the opening scene of Dog Soldiers, where the woman is a missionary and is talking to uh, the protagonist, who is a very cynical um, journalist in in uh, Vietnam during the Vietnam War. I mean, what a great scene. And it's a scene about faith, um, about evil, the nature of evil. Um, so you can always su successfully incorporate themes of faith. Uh, in your work. Uh, it shouldn't be, you know, it's not something to slap in there. And I don't believe in, you know, being too didactic because that immediately kicks us out. We don't want to see, you know, a straw man. Um, but if you, if these issues interest you, uh, I would just say, go ahead and make, but make sure that it's, you're not, it's not a textbook. It's not a tract. It is fully engaged in the, you know, the issues and suffering and development of those characters. Uh, the Poisonwood Bible, you know, there was a lot of, as a religious family, missionaries in Africa, and there's a lot of thought about issues of faith. Uh, some of our greatest literature uh, deals with this, so uh, have at it, I would say. Uh, should I edit as I go? I think that lightly, very lightly, you know, you don't want to squash the, the um, creative impulse uh, that just wants to go. Think about think of a greyhound being let out of the, the front door. It's like, wow, you know, I'm free. And I'm just going to run. That is the creative mind. Go ahead. You need that. But it doesn't hurt to, you know, put a little, you know, a little really long leash on that dog. Um, I edit by going in to what I wrote the day before. I read it, I'm gonna clean it up a little bit to keep going. It keeps the tone even, it keeps the voice even, you know, consistent. Um, but the bulk of editing is after a first draft. And then you see what you've got, and then you start shaping it. Uh, draw, getting rid of things that don't fit anymore. Um, bringing, you know, bringing the senses in, working on the dialogue, um, shaping it, getting it in, you know, maybe you don't really like your ending. You just sort of got to the end. This is sort of the shape of it. So the first draft is sort of like cutting out the fabric and it's sort of going to be this shape. And then you, you continue to work on it. So I go back and forth. I usually edit, I usually do four drafts, um, but I also work on it every day a little bit. And one more question. Okay. Uh, should I use real life settings or made up settings? I find real life settings. Um, I don't really use real life settings. Even when I do, I always fictionalize. I always combine settings. Um, especially if it's a you know a place where a scene is going to take place. I always allow myself to invent um, just because you can do more with the scene. Um, but people love realized settings that they recognize. you know they find that very exciting. Uh, the important thing about made up settings is that they need to be consistent. So I usually often I'll have a, an actual setting that I'm picturing. But maybe it's three or four, or I'll use photographs and or maps. I'll draw the room so I remember where they come in. The consistency is the important thing. 
and to be able to get all the senses and all the la layers of landscape and really being able to use that setting. Um, here's one. In a writing class, my teacher said we should always use present tense when talking about action in a novel. That is that right? No, <laughs> that is not right. If you are writing in present tense, then you use present tense to describe the action. If you are using past tense, then you use past tense. We went so and so. We did this, not we go, etc. No, generally past tense is more. It's more standard. It's more practical. It's very useful. Uh, it helps the writer in certain ways that first person does not. It's a, an active decision. Nobody should say you should always use present tense. No. I usually find ideas from real life that would make great short stories. How can I make it fiction instead of just retelling the real event? Well, that's... I, you know, the first thing you do is give him a different name. Picture a different person. Picture somebody else. And then think about what was it about that event that really caught you? What's the emotion? What's, what's the moment? And then try to get rid of a lot of, a lot of the stuff of things written on um, real stories is that the chain of causation um, that leads from this to this, to th the person has a really hard time breaking that chain and just getting to the event that stimulated them and then setting it up in a way that makes it more, there's more compression and there's more an understandable um, group of people um, leading up to it and kind of holding it. So say you saw somebody get run over by a bus. You don't have to be the one to see them get run over by a bus. It can be somebody completely different from you, but some reason that watching them being run over by, by a bus is important. And some thought you had about it is what that story is about. But it doesn't have to be you. It doesn't have to be you just had a fight with your husband and then left and somebody got run over by a bus. You can make it mean something eat more easily by changing everything around it. Um, and that's what we're looking for is to raise the meaning of events, make them mean something. That's why fiction is better than life because life is just one thing after another, but fiction means something. And so I would say, you know, make change everything uh, except the event that you want to describe. Um, my story settings are similar to where I live, but I prefer to use fictional names. How do I go about making the names? I do that all the time. So uh, I wrote a, um, I wrote a, a short story where a woman works in a restaurant that I go to that's called Farfalla. And in Farfalla means butterfly, but it's also a shape of pasta. So I called it Orzo, another shape of pasta. Um, how do I go about making the names up? So fictional names, I, I just find cor correlations. There's a bar I go to that was built in a firehouse that was also in that same story. And uh, it's called... It's called the Edendale, uh, but I called it the firehouse. So people who live in the neighborhood would go like, oh yeah, I know where that is. Uh, and then sometimes great names can be thematic. Like one of my favorite places in any book ever was um, the mezcal bar that the consul goes to in under the volcano so he's drinking himself to death and there is a bar that is like the scummiest scummiest bar um imaginable it's a mezcal bar that only opens at four in the morning and it's called the Feralito, which means the lighthouse 
So there's an ironic title. Uh, those are wonderful. Um, okay, I'm writing a novel about a family of seven. The novel is about the whole family, but I keep wondering if I should focus on just one character as the main character. Can a novel have multiple characters as main characters? Um, I find picking a point of view character is incredibly, incredibly helpful. And you will see this when you try to finish the book. To have a single protagonist will aid you immensely when you have to finish the book. Uh, having multiple protagonists is always a dangerous thing because how do you end it? The person who is the last man standing, the storyline that remains, is the, the main protagonist and will close out your book. But I've read many of read many books that have multiple protagonists. Um, the Poisonwood Bible, we just talked about that. Um, every James Elroy book has multiple protagonists, but as he closes the book down, you will close off the stories and be focusing more and more on a single character. And then that's the character who really is the protagonist of the book. So yes, you can, um, but keep an eye out for the real protagonist. Um, I always learned in school not to use contractions in writing. Oh, I should talk about that multiple protagonist problem. It, it also is difficult if you, uh, the way a lot of people do the having several main, uh, main characters, per, point of view characters, is that they braid the story. They have like Deborah's story and then we go a while in Deborah's point of view and then we change over to Pamela's point of view. And then we're in Pamela's point of view for a while and then we are in mom's point of view for a while. And then we go back to Deborah. So it has multiple protagonists but no more than one in any section no point, multiple points of view in any section. If you have multiple points of view in one section, then you're an authorial omniscient and you're dipping into everybody's head. And that requires a rhythm. Um, and it can be done for sure. Um, but because a scene is about a change in the point of view character where they realize something. Uh, something happens that changes things for them. You can't have a scene where we do some, do Mikey and I, that's the way kids tell a story. Mikey and I went to the store and blah, 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 and we did this and we did that. And it's very hard to uh, make a story happen, a, a, in a, a story that it will involve the reader uh, by having we an undifferentiated multiple cast of characters as your protagonist. You need to pick one. Story about four girls, there will be one who becomes the point of view character, even if in different sections, each one has might have its own section. But every scene needs its point of view character. Um, I always learn in school not to use contractions in writing, but I see it all the time in fiction. It makes sense to use it in dialogue, but what about everywhere else? In academic writing, you might have been told that it's too casual to say can't and don't. You know, um, you know, the mastodons did not do blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's fine for a nonfiction. Once you're in fiction, it's all about the level of diction, and it is very rare not to have contractions. I had not, I didn't put contractions in my Russian books because I felt that I wanted the elevation of diction and the distance in time. But reading it, it was too stilted for a 16-year-old girl. 
17 year old girl it still seemed too stilted so you're always working that you know just where do you want to pitch the where do you want to pitch the elevation of the diction um very personal taste it's all taste it's that's the writing part is that it's not about rules it's about taste um how do I begin a story that needs a lot of explanation, like when it takes place in another time or if the character has an extraordinary skill? Oh, well, you're talking to somebody who just wrote two books about the Russian Revolution. Um, there's a lot of explanation that needs it, and you cannot stuff it down the reader's throat like a Christmas goose. You know, you have to have a live scene and give the reader only as much explanation as they need to understand the scene that's going down. Otherwise, it starts sounding like a textbook. I had a student who wrote a book about uh, the, the civil rights movement. And, you know, you, you, she, she really had to work so hard not to make it sound like a textbook. Uh, and it's about personalizing things, having people catch a little bit of gossip, a little rumor, read something in the newspaper, um, hear from someone standing in the, like in my book, a lot of things are found out standing on the bread line, you know, the rumors that go back and forth or something they see on a handbill that's been passed out or something people were talking about in the, in the cafeteria at the orphanage, um, so watch out how you dole out that explanation. Um, what is a novella? How is it different than a short story? A novella is a long short story. Uh, a novella is unlike a novel in that it doesn't take a lot of side branches. It follows the story, but it allows it to open up. So a short story is probably maybe 30 pages max, 40 pages max. When you start getting into something longer than 40 pages, you're in a novella. Um, and the last question here is, what is the difference between science fiction and fantasy? Well, I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of different take on this one. Uh, I would say as a non-practitioner of either art and a reader of both, I would say anything having to do with magic, if there is magic, if there is supernatural stuff going on, um, you're into the fantasy realm. If there are alternative um realities that have a naturalistic basis, you're in sci-fi. Um, so science fiction is more like realistic fiction set in the future, usually. Uh, often there are, um, you know, there, there can be powers that have been developed uh, but they're presented in a very rational way. If they're psi powers, uh, it's presented as a logical, rational thing. Uh, if you have just people who are magical and dragons, you know, dinosaurs living at the same time as people and things that are not... Um, that are not based in the physics and... Uh, of this world um, or could be conceived that way. I would say that's more in your fantasy line. And then sometimes it, there is a blur between them. Uh, but I would say fantasy has more about the magical. It often speaks to mythology. Um, and science fiction speaks more to human endeavor, um, but a blurred line 
when you get into something like, you know, Octavia Butler, you know, is she science fiction or fantasy? I would say science fiction. Future. Uh, would, you know, Phillips, Jose Farmer, aliens, having sex with aliens. And that's getting really into the borderland. Uh, Philip K. Dick, I would say science fiction, because it speaks to our society. Uh, it's comment on our society and very few magical things, you know, maybe some psi powers, but that's about it. So anyway, thank you for watching. This has been Writing Wednesday, and uh, I now have a YouTube that I've been putting up these Writing Wednesdays, um, uh, my archive up on YouTube. So subscribe, support us, and uh, we'll see you next week.